So CRIN is a Canadian not-for-profit organization focused on bringing together the, all the players in the clean energy innovation space to help the oil and gas industry innovate for a cleaner energy future. The way that uh, CRIN does that is through bringing people together. We have two streams of focus, if you will. Um, one is on technology development and deployment, where we actually fund projects. Uh, and the other is on what we call ecosystem development. With the projects that we fund, every project has to be a partnership between an uh, oil and gas producer or other industry player and an innovator. And that way we have the industry pull that's needed to uh, uh, bring innovation to reality. And we focus on later stage technologies. So in the technology readiness level vernacular, that's TRL 6 to 9. Um, CRIN is a, uh, a network of networks, as we call it. There are over 4,000 members with CRIN, and we have membership from across the spectrum of innovation um, in Canada for uh, oil and gas uh, and clean technology. We have members from what we call the uh, technology adopters community. So that could be your oil and gas producers, um, um, other, other industries, other end users of, uh, of, of the uh, hydrocarbon products. We have the innovators who are the ones with the technology solutions. We have funders, the ones with the money to pay for these uh, projects. We have people who are we call support services. They, they provide support to business development, to, uh, uh, to industry associations, et cetera. And we have what we call the talent builders. So there's the five different sector groupings that all participate with, uh, with CRIN and what CRIN uh, is all about. CRIN was uh, fortunate enough to receive $100 million of funding from the Government of Canada towards those two streams that I mentioned around technology development and deployment and ecosystem development. CRIN's vision is that Canada is the global leader in clean hydrocarbons from source to end use. So that's right from the production of hydrocarbons in the first place to the end user uh, down, down, the, uh, down the pipeline. Um, and CRIN's mission is to enable the commercialization and uh, adoption of technologies that are being developed. Um, with our funding, we'll fund up to 50% of the project value, up to a maximum of $10 million per project. And we have projects that work across seven technical themes. And so we have technical themes around digital oil and gas, so efficiencies and such things and uh, uh, leak detections and whatnot. We have uh, uh, methane uh, quantification, monitoring and abatement. We have um, um, land and well site reclamation, we have water technology, cleaner fuels, what we call carbon capture and value added products. So think about things like bitumen beyond combustion or you know, carbon fibers, uh, hydrogen would fall into that category, carbon capture of course. CRIN helps people get their jobs done at the end of the day. We have over 4,000 members. We could easily have eight or 10,000 members and, you know, in, in, this, uh, in this organization. It's important to recognize that uh, membership in CRIN is free. The only cost to you is um, the signing of a social contract. And our social contract essentially tells you, or you tell the world, um, that you're happy to cooperate and you're happy for other members to reach out to you so that you can be part of this ecosystem, part of the innovation, part of the change that's needed in order to achieve ambitious uh, environmental goals that we have uh, in industry. So membership is free. And one of the benefits to membership is access to some of the tools. And so we have tools that are available for our members to help navigate the ecosystem. We have what's called our ecosystem map, which is a clickable PDF file that has information on resources from, you know, who are, who are, the, uh, who are the funders out there in provincial governments and federal governments that might be able to help you with your innovations if you're an innovator. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you get access to potential customers? Who, who are the... Uh, who are the support services that are out there. And th this tool is, it's essentially like a Google search on steroids. So you could spend all week trying to find these things, uh, doing uh, detailed searches, or you can come to CRIN, come to our ecosystem map, um, and uh, navigate that uh, as, part of, as part of your uh, membership. The other tool we have, and this is uh, very helpful for both, for, for innovators, for adopters of technology, and for funders, we call it Innovation Central. And it's a place where innovators can upload information about their offerings so that funders and adopters can use it as a bit of a, a library or like a virtual Rolodex of technology. And uh, again, free for, uh, free for members to participate in. There's, there's two ways that CRIN helps, uh, helps uh, industry and innovators. 
And the, the one is through direct funding of projects, where for projects that meet our criteria, that, and that part of that criteria is a partnership between an industry player and an innovator, we will pay up to 50% of the costs, up to a maximum of $10 million per project. And that, that clearly is good incentive for some projects that might not otherwise uh, uh, be, uh, be developed, give them the opportunity to, to develop and achieve the environmental goals that uh, um, we're trying to achieve. The other way CRIN supports is as part of the ecosystem and bringing, bringing people together. So in, in the technical theme areas that we focus on, for example, I'll, I'll use methane, uh, methane quantification uh, measurement and abatement as an example. We bring people together that are interested in that space. So innovators who have solutions for that space, um, technology adopters who might have uh, a, a challenge uh, in, in, that, uh, in that area, and, and others that are interested. We bring them together so that they can uh, actually make the connections that they need to progress new projects. Um, the ultimate goal for us is to connect people who might not otherwise connect and that together they can innovate. So through participation in the CRIN network, our members have an opportunity to work together to find innovative solutions and ultimately improve the industry and improve the uh, way of life for Albertans and Canadians. Cathero Solutions is a clean tech company. We are a technology provider for remote well site operations, and we are in the business of removing methane from pneumatic device venting. What we are doing is on remote or unelectrified sites where grid power is hard to come by, and sometimes even when it's there, we are actuating pneumatic devices using nitrogen. Nitrogen gas is inert, non-toxic, non-polluting. It's 78% of the air that we breathe is made up of nitrogen. And what our founders and inventors did is conceive of a new way to run remote well site operations without having a power source. So our technology utilizes cryogenic product, which is liquid nitrogen. It's stored at minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 200 degrees Celsius. And it's in a proprietary cryogenic vessel. So we bring these vessels to all sorts of different remote well sites, of which there are about 500,000 across North America that are routinely venting methane gas in their day-to-day -day well site operations. The reason they're doing so is out of convenience. They need a high pressured gas to actuate or run their pneumatic devices, valves, pumps, all sorts of different kind of operational um, instruments and tools. And in order to do so, the high pressured gas is required and they pull that out of their well site. But really all they need is a compressed gas of any kind. So by swapping in nitrogen gas for methane gas, we're in the business of fuel switching and we are able to vent nitrogen back to air instead of venting methane to the atmosphere after it has actuated those devices. So we take remote well sites from substantial amount of overall methane uh, emissions per year or per day to zero emissions immediately by plugging in our system and uh, eliminating the need for methane gas on site. Katheros is contributing to the elimination of emissions from oil and gas production because it is eliminating the need for methane venting from well sites, or rather the need to utilize compressed methane gas coming out of the ground to actuate pneumatic devices, after which it is vented uncombusted to the atmosphere. We know that methane as a gas is 84 times more potent as a greenhouse warming gas than CO2. So when we utilize that 84 times metric, and we already know that CO2 is harmful, we can imagine the warming potential that this venting has. And some might say that a single gas site venting methane gas on its own isn't all that material. But when taken collectively across half a million well sites in North America alone that are routinely venting uncombusted methane gas, again, just out of convenience because they need something to operate their pneumatic devices when they're away from grid power, 
we really see an enormous impact. And what we know is if we look at Canada's emissions overall, as 26% of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from oil and gas operations. So the production side of the equation, not transportation, not aviation or you know, combustion, we're talking production. We know that 40% of those emissions are coming from venting. And so if we can eliminate that at the source with a clean inert fuel source like nitrogen gas to power those pneumatic devices instead, we've got some enormous material gains in our emissions reduction. And that's what we're seeing. The Cathero solution is a really low hanging fruit solution for emissions targets. And that's because it's a simple, it's a simple swap of uh, operating technologies. Rather than utilizing compressed methane gas coming out of the ground, the operator sends that down the sales line so it can be combusted into CO2, something that's less harmful as a, as a greenhouse warming gas. And instead we're swapping in nitrogen gas. So that site goes to zero methane emissions immediately. The last piece of the puzzle is that because there is a, it's a closed system and there's a, a relationship between methane gas and nitrogen gas. So this is chemistry 101. For every singular unit of nitrogen you use, you have eliminated or abated 1.2764 units of methane gas. That's the gas equivalency ratio between methane and nitrogen. And so we know exactly what's been abated from each and every site in this closed loop fuel switching scenario and the material emissions are enormous. They add up really quickly for producers and our producer partners are finally having empirical data to say, this is what we were venting and this is what we've just abated. And it's really exciting in that regard. I would say um, outside of the organizations like uh, Emissions Reduction Alberta and Alberta Innovates, those networks, um, the fundamentally the best incentive that operators have been given to really um, accelerate technologies, particularly in emissions, is through the carbon offset program. So the carbon offset program allows for carbon credits to be generated by eliminating emissions in our world, methane emissions, that aren't currently regulated to be eliminated. So the industry, or the government's done a very good job of being able to um, incentivize companies to be able to act in a way that is environmentally friendly. Um, some good examples over the years is when in our world where you take methane emissions from pneumatic devices, there was a program several years ago put in place to eliminate emissions taking pneumatic devices from high bleed down to low bleed. And in doing that, companies that did that were allowed to generate offset credits, which actually paid for the program um, it, <clears throat> to eliminate the emissions. So that is still in place. It's important that these kind of incentives take place in the province uh, because that provides a real fertile ground for companies to jump in and make a difference on emissions. Now typically those kind of incentives are the forerunners to regulations. So before being told a stick approach, thou shalt do this, the Alberta government has enabled a system which allows companies to really benefit economically, put value on the, the elimination of emissions and as a consequence, cause the scaling of these technologies to advance a lot faster than they, other would, they would otherwise. In our industry, um, right now there's a focus on the total elimination of methane from pneumatic devices. That's what we do as a company. So the industry is already incentivized and now regulated to minimize those. The next step is to take them to zero. So through this offset program in Alberta, there's been a lot more activity generated in this province in eliminating emissions because they can monetize the work that they're doing in eliminating the emissions. So as regulations come in, which the feds are suggesting are gonna be happening here soon, uh, same thing is happening in the United States. Um, <clears throat> Alberta has an environment where you can actually benefit and help offset your costs 
and deploying new technologies into the field. So the way that Catheros has benefited from a uh, encouraging, beneficial, provincial, federal government um, and industry associations has been pretty significant. So when you create an idea, when you come up with an idea and then you see if it has applicability, if it's actually going to work, you need to be able to pitch the idea. And so in our world, in Alberta, when you have a new idea, there's different organizations that you can go to and there's different entities within the governments that you can um, be supported through monetary funding basis. In our case, we originally came up with a good idea, my partner and I. We needed a company, first of all, to be able to trial it. So we had to convince an industry operator that this idea was worth trialing. Then we went to the Petroleum Technology Alliance of Canada and said, look at this great idea, can you help support us? Which they did. Through CanEric and the federal government financing, they supported our project in getting this pilot off the ground and actually getting it operating in the field. So that was a very, very good first step. So now we have a technology that we know works. We know it's simple. We know it can scale. The next thing we need to do is demonstrate that it's not just a one-off situation that we can go through hundreds and hundreds of these locations. In Western Canada, there's over 100,000 locations that are venting methane. And to go at them at scale, you need to have a technology that's really simple, but you need to have a distribution network and the ability to be able to execute on it. So the next phase of this kind of funding and support came from CRIN. So Crin said, all right, we like your project. We like what your needs are, which is to be able to take your technology and apply it over a broad base of wells. See if it can work, see if you can actually execute on it, whether you can take a tank and keep it filled once a month with liquid nitrogen and use that now to eliminate the methane on lease. So that's what we did. We took that, we took our technology, we took funding from Crin, we, we had partnerships with both Oventiv and with Synovus, and then we went into the field and we made it happen. We built the special purpose trucks, we deployed the capital required to get all these nitrogen cryogenic tanks into the field operating, and we proved in very short order that this was going to be a successful technology. So in doing that, the world was watching. So then we started to get recognition, whether it was from the EPA in the United States, whether it was Colorado Clean Industries Association. Here in Alberta, we were getting a lot of recognition. Um, <clears throat> and so it was these funding, these um, entities throughout both the provincial and federal government, which enabled us to really bootstrap the technology to something that could be world-class that could scale at a global rate, which is what we're doing. At Econa, we are making low cost industrial scale hydrogen whenever and wherever it is needed. The Econa Excalibur reactor is a pulsed methane pyrolysis process. We inject combustion energy fuel and oxygen into the reactor. We break down the molecule of hydrocarbon into hydrogen and a solid carbon. Due to the fact that we use combustion energy for our pyrolysis process, we do not require electricity for the chemical process. Another value proposition of Econa's technology is we are making a solid carbon and therefore this technology is very deployable globally where there is no access to CO2 sequestration infrastructure. We are working with several academias to test and validate the morphology of this carbon for it to be applied to the construction and agricultural industry. Addressing global climate change 
is one of the largest endeavors the world has ever had to face. At Econa Power, we are removing the carbon from natural gas to decarbonize the natural gas industry. Our solid carbon that we make as a co-product is currently being tested to replace high emitting materials within construction and agriculture. Within Econa, our scientists are continuously looking for efficiencies and opportunities to improve the reactor and the emissions. We will be working with upstream producers to work on upstream emissions. We are also looking at the feedstock development. We will be working with producers of renewable natural gas to test and validate the use of RNG. Where we see the biggest relevance of Econa's technology on a global scale is those hard to, to decarbonize areas that do not have access to CO2 sequestration infrastructure. The ideal place for Econa's technology is also to develop our export industry in Canada, exporting LNG to Asia and Europe and to have Econa's technology at the customer site to decarbonize that natural gas. I arrived in Alberta 16 years ago and emigrated to a country and province that was full of like-minded, entrepreneurial, enthusiastic, trustworthy people. At Econa, we wouldn't be where we are today without the continuous government support through CRIN. It has helped us achieve milestones, build partnerships, extend relationships, and deploy this technology to where it is today. Where we see our technology evolving in the next five to 10 years is we have our 200 kilogram a day reactor in Burnaby, BC in our 10,000 square foot testing and validation facility. We are also deploying a one ton a day pilot here in Alberta. We will continue to scale this technology to meet market demands to a 20, 100 and 300 ton per day capacity. So my name is Jordan Sicoria, and I'm president and CEO of Arium Analytics. And our company has a unique technology uh, that is a flapping wing drone, looks like a peregrine falcon. And we use it in the energy and oil sand space in order to reduce uh, bird mortalities and tailings. And our client that we work with on this project is Imperial Oil. Um, but this technology doesn't just apply in the energy space, it also applies anywhere there's negative human-bird interactions. So that would be reducing bird strikes at airports, that would also be in military and defense to protect air bases from the same issue, and also to reduce food loss and food scarcity issues due to birds in agriculture. Our solution's better than the current solutions because most of the current solutions out there um, involve being static and stuck in a very specific location. Um, since this is essentially a new age scarecrow and is movable, um, we're able to cover more area and we're also tying into biomimicry by, um, we look exactly like the most feared aerial predator in the world, a female peregrine falcon, which is known on six of seven continents. And most bird species that are flocking species have been predated on by a peregrine in the past. And we're also better than our closest competition, which would be live falconry, um, because at the end of the day, Robert can be put in a box, it's fed batteries, um, and we are able to also take these beautiful raptors and, and put them out of harm's way rather than being put into use uh, to prevent bird issues. Our company promotes environmental sustainability with Robert by actually reducing bird mortalities and impacts on bird habitat. So we work strictly on biodiversity, wildlife protection, and using real life and biomimicry to move birds into safer locations rather than having them negatively impacted. Um, in addition, our technology also has a support for greenhouse gas reduction by reducing the number of people that would be required in the field to do the more traditional methods, uh, removing certain things that currently require um, the use of propane, such as propane cannons. Uh, so we have an ancillary support on reducing the GHG emissions as well. 
So to date, our impact in the oil sands is that we've been able to help reduce mortalities by up to 75% in some of our clients' projects, which is a huge reduction in the impact of birds in tailings management, as well as just wildlife in general. Um, in other settings, such as airports, we've been able to reduce bird strikes for what they call large mass birds, or geese, gulls, those that would do damage to aircraft, by over 50% just by implementing Robird. In the context of global sustainability challenges, we see Robird being able to be applied on a global scale in mainly everywhere has airports and on the agricultural side, um, it's still the same impact. So from an airport setting, negative human bird interactions and bird strikes happen all over the world. It is a constant daily challenge. Uh, so globally, helping reduce bird strikes, protect bird species and do it in a sustainable way is a key initiative of ours. Um, in the agricultural space, again, food scarcity is becoming a massive, massive challenge. Um, and the amount of crop loss that happens in high yield fruit crops, such as grapes, such as blueberries, cherries, is uh, it, it's extravagant, it's exceptionally large. Uh, those direct losses are so great that even if we could um, reduce the amount of food that birds eat, it will help save billions of dollars of crop loss annually. Um, and then anywhere where you also have surface mines, tailings, places where birds really shouldn't be landing to rest, especially waterfowl, uh, that is another area where just having this sheer presence is going to have a positive effect and encourage birds to move elsewhere where they don't have a perceived predator patrolling the location. Um, we chose to have our uh, company based in Calgary because I'm a born and raised Albertan and uh, we've been here with our companies since day one. But that's not why we started it here, that's why we keep it here. And, and the other reason for that is because Alberta as a province has a very, very strong background in agriculture, has a very strong background in energy. And with that, as you grow up here, you learn about environmental sustainability. You learn about the need for resource extraction, but how to do it in a safe and protective way. And so we want our technology to add to that, to continue to enhance it and to continue to allow us to produce some of the best energy products in the world. And in addition to that, also continue to showcase how our technologies and our experiences um, can be shared with the rest of the world. We, we have a lot of trust here. We, we work really hard with other communities and other countries uh, because we do feel that we are best in brand and uh, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Now the province of Alberta has been incredibly supportive as well uh, through many, many initiatives that we've worked with through everything from trade missions. In fact, that's where we started, I was on a trade mission in 2016 um, to find the Robert technology before we brought it to Canada. And that trade mission was supported by the province of Alberta and has been instrumental in who Arium is as a company today. Canada has supported the growth of our technology through partners like the Queen Resource Innovation Network and, and other grants as well. Um, we've been able to leverage the Trade Commissioner's Service uh, to look at this from a global perspective. But more importantly, it is a technology for Canada. So being able to apply our technology across Canada in many mining situations into the agricultural sectors, as well as protecting the airports across the entire country is a very important step for what we're doing. Um, and then that same aspect can be applied globally um, in many other countries who have the same challenges. And I think going forward, we have a fantastic partnership to help us promote and grow our opportunities and showcase these incredible technologies to everyone in the world. We envision our technology evolving to be fully autonomous over time. Um, so right now it is piloted um, it is an incredibly effective tool, but in order to continue to evolve, it needs to be able to fly by itself and be able to intercept and protect birds before they ever get in harm's way. So along that journey, what we've been able to do is leverage the existing technology and where we've come, but on a global scale, again, agriculture, food scarcity issues are all over the world right now. And if we can help protect crops, 
uh, from a global perspective, um, that's going to be incredibly important. Bird strikes at airports, that regulatory and safety perspective, um, that again is another challenge that's happening all over the world. And with things like climate change, with changes to migratory bird patterns, these problems are going to continue to get worse. Um, and new technologies are going to be required on a global scale to do that. In Alberta, we see continuing to support the energy industry in reducing those negative human bird interactions. Um, and we see the fact that, again, Alberta has an incredible amount of regulatory compliance, environmental protection, and stewardship that we already focus on, and applying that to the rest of the world with partners such as Alberta and CRIN is important to us and, and is important to where we want to be as a company. Civictus is a clean tech company developing clean energy hubs for the energy transition. We can produce low carbon hydrogen and hydrogen carriers like ammonia and methanol at a fraction of the emissions from today's technology and with no green premium cheaper than today's technology. Civictus's patented process of enhanced hydrogen recovery is a Canadian innovation being piloted in Alberta but suitable for resources around Western Canada and Eastern Canada. Uh, with that technology in place and, those, and that expertise in place, Civictus can take this technology around the world and Canada can be a leader at taking coal and turning it from a source of CO2 into a sink of CO2 while producing low carbon products for the energy transition. So we drill two horizontal wells and the space between the wells is the panel. If it was a long wall mine, you would drill shafts and you would have a, a cutter going back and forth between. But instead of that, we use heat and we shuttle the heat back and forth between the wells. Inject oxygen, produce syngas. Inject oxygen, produce syngas. I switch them and, in, and you use the heat of, of the partial combustion and gasification to consume the coal as you come back. So you act, it actually is a long wall mine down below. It is the same void that a long wall mine would be at the end of the day, which at the end of the day, we fill it with CO2. So we've filled the pillars of the mine, the pillars that hold the roof up, we filled those up with CO2 during operations, and then we fill the panel up with CO2 and develop another panel. And if you want to wrap your head around it, the first panel running at idle, that's our first project. Half a petajoule of energy produces seven tons a day of hydrogen. That same panel run at full throttle is five petajoules of energy. It goes up to 70 to 80 tons a day of hydrogen. There's no market for 80 tons a day of hydrogen today. And our plants would, would typically be configured around three panels running at the same time so 80 tons times three, 240,000 tons of hydrogen is what you could produce if you ever had the market to sell it. Or you take that and you produce 500,000 tons of methanol, which is a hydrogen carrier. Or you take the ammonia off your air separation plant, sorry, you take the, the nitrogen off your air separation plant and you mix it with the hydrogen and you make ammonia. And then on the bigger scale, you take methanol and feed it to microbes, bacteria, bacteria that get their sole source of energy and carbon out of methanol. They eat alcohol and they like a little ammonia for dessert for the nitrogen. And those single cell protein are the exact same single cell protein that ICI Imperial Chemical produced commercially till 1986 in Billingham, England. That is a proven high quality animal feed and you're producing it without photosynthesis. And you're producing it without impacts to fresh water and you're producing it without impacts to land, deforestation or fishing all the fish out of the ocean. So the true game changer in our technology is to be able to produce energy and to produce 
animal feed. Savictus's clean energy hubs have the ability to produce hydrogen at about a third of today's standard for green hydrogen. When we look at our site and how scalable it is, the actual quantitative amount that we could reduce carbon depends on what size we have, but the small project, commercial project, will, will produce at about a third of the emissions of green hydrogen. We are lower carbon than gray, lower carbon than blue, and lower carbon than the standard for green hydrogen. And there's no green premium, we're cheaper than the mall too. Savictus' technology is scalable and can target energy resources around the world. We use deep stranded resources, recover the energy we need, recover the beneficial gases we want to sell, and sequester the carbon back into the same formations. This is a technology that will be first piloted in Canada, but can be used around the world, giving countries like India and China another way to use deep stranded resources without the carbon impact. Savictus chose Alberta for our first site for a number of reasons. Alberta had the regulations in place, has the uh, equipment and the technology and the people in place to make our, our process work. Savictus has deep stranded resources that are not suitable for other oil and gas operations. And Alberta really was the place uh, to start this process. Our second project is in Wyoming, very similar to Alberta, but Alberta stood out with the people and the regulations in place to make it happen. That is the Alberta advantage. There are people that truly know how to make things happen. And they, um, they leverage what's been done in the past. Savictus' vision is to be the most positively impactful and profitable company on the planet. We see our technology being used around the world to provide developing countries with the energy they need to develop and the place they need to sequester the carbon on site. We see stranded resources around the world being used in a different way, a paradigm shift, changing the way we use the resource and the way we sequester carbon. We don't need uh, a government supplied carbon trunk line, we put the carbon dioxide back into the ground underneath the plant in the same formation. Savictus' technology is massively scalable around the world. We can build plants from seven ton a day to 80 ton a day to multiples of 80 ton a day of, of hydrogen as an example. We are scalable, we are globally um, deployable and uh, we can be the most positively impact company on the planet by producing low carbon products for the hydrogen economy. Sensor Up provides GEMS, gas emission management solution. It's a cloud AI platform for uh, methane emissions reduction. Today's methane detection and repair typically using one or two sensor networks. However, the real solution must use multi-sensors from the space all the way to the ground, uh, you know, space sensors, air sensors, drones, ground, and triggering action and dispatch somebody to uh, fix them. However, today they are like a disorganized, it's, it's a complex ecosystem, which is very, very difficult to streamline it. There's where we come in. GEMS put them all together, integrate multi-sensor systems so that we can detect early, we can fix them early, and then we can quantify them accurately. For methane emissions detection, there are many different sensor companies, and they try to beat the sensor to do a detection early and fix them. However, we are different than them because we are a multi-sensor solution. We make each different system shine so we can have a better solution. For methane emissions reduction, you can only improve what you measure. And we put all different sensors together so you can do it better. And we recently raised a round from uh, climate investment. And then part of the round, we have a, they bring in a uh, flagship customer, Oxy, Occidental Petroleum. So right now, uh, Oxy is operationalized their whole methane emissions reduction using SensorUp Cloud. 
and other customers, we have TC Energy, for example, in Canada. And then we are uh, in, you know, expanding to the world uh, in the next year. So for example, one day, our customers, their ground sensor detect methane emissions early. And two hours later, their fly sensor detected the methane emissions as well. And then by combining all together, we can use the most accurate reading from these two sensor systems because they never agree with each other. However, we can also know the start time of the mission. So instead of you know, uh, using six months back as the quantification time, the T start, and we can use two hours. In this way, we are able to detect early and then we can repair them early because we know the root cause. In this case, we can prevent unnecessary trips and that's operational excellence. Since our James is designed for any oil and gas companies uh, around the world, onshore and offshore. Today, we have customers in North America, and, but in ne next year, we're expanding to Europe and Mideast. Alberta is one of the best places in the world to start a clean tech, uh, high tech company. One, number one, we have the industry to support it, the oil and gas industry. Number two, we have the regulation to help us innovate within the regulation. And number three is the ecosystem is great. We have great talent in both cities. When I started the company, it is a research project in the university. I'm a professor. And, but with the ecosystem support, we are able to raise money, commercialize the technology, find a customer, and find a very important problem to solve. And but at the core, our technology is a geospatial Internet of Things cloud. Today, we start from methane emissions reduction. But tomorrow, we are going to expand to any physical operations require multi-sensors. And we want to be that geospatial IoT platform to improve safety, visibility, predictions, and operational excellence. My name is Andrea Crook, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of OptiSize, a company specializing in high-resolution subsurface imaging and analytics. We are, in one space, a startup in the, the innovation space, but on the other hand, we've also been in business since 2011. So uh, we didn't start out as uh, technology developers. Uh, we started out to provide uh, high-end consulting services for oil and gas clients. Um, I began my career at Shell Canada uh, as a processor and in seismic acquisition. And um, we, as, as industry changed, we noticed that a lot of the work that was done in these large corporations, um, smaller and mid-sized companies would benefit from it. So as industry changed, uh, myself and uh, my co-founder decided to start a company to provide effectively the, um, the technology and the opportunities that large corporations have internally to a, a broader audience here in Canada. Uh, interestingly, as we developed our, our consultancy, uh, we found that many of the off-the-shelf software products um, it just weren't being developed in the direction that we wanted to go with, with innovation. So we started coding our own algorithms uh, to make our jobs easier. And uh, when clients saw the, the benefit of the software that we were using internally, they began to ask if they could get copies of it, and uh, we started selling it. When basically the world came to a halt in 2020, uh, we had the opportunity to do a deep dive into research. And that's when we reached out to Alberta Innovates uh, for funding to sponsor the research. And they introduced us to COSIA. Um, and we had five companies come on board to sponsor a project to look into ways to reduce the land footprint of acquiring subsurface images. Uh, our goal with the original project was to reduce the number of trees cut by 35% and potentially reduce some of the emissions associated with having equipment in the field. Um, but as the prog uh, project progressed, uh, we actually achieved a 50% reduction. And, and given that success uh, in, the, in the desktop studies, we then went to the Clean Resource Innovation Network 
as well as um, IRAP, which is in the, the Industrial Research Assistance Program, for funding to go to the field and conduct uh, a field study of our EcoSize technology. Uh, we were successful in securing nearly seven million in non-dilutive funding to, to conduct uh, the field trials. We acquired the first data set last winter and are in the process of evaluating it. And we did reduce uh, the land footprint by 52% and uh, preliminary emissions reduction calculations show that we're able to reduce the emissions by, by 25%. So uh, we're very excited about the potential of this technology. Although we've tested it in uh, oil and gas for, for reducing the emissions associated with oil sands production, it's equally applicable to carbon capture, uh, lithium, uh, helium, hydrogen exploration, um, as well as nuclear waste management. Globally, in order to achieve net zero, we are going to need carbon capture and storage technologies. Um, our technology enables us to do those projects with a lighter land footprint and fewer emissions associated with acquiring the data and then monitoring the data in the subsurface. The pace of growth in our company has greatly been influenced by the support we've received from the, the innovation ecosystem. Um, that includes funders as well as collaborators. Uh, we would not be at the point we are with the development of the technology if we had had to rely on only internal growth to fund the commercialization. So I believe this has taken our technology journey from um, a decade or more down to the order of two to four years. In the carbon capture and storage space, uh, we are looking at running some technology trials next year to fully validate the time-lapse aspect of EcoSize. And then looking beyond further into the future, we are getting interest in the technology both in South America, Australia, and the US uh, for use in the traditional energy sectors to reduce their environmental footprint, but also moving into emerging sectors such as critical mineral exploration. HT Nano is building more sustainable water treatment solutions for the resources sector. We started with the question of whether we could build a more passive, economical, and sustainable solution that integrated well with the remediation landscape for energy and mining operations here in Canada. Through this, we developed SolarPass. SolarPass is a floating catalyst technology that deploys onto the surface of water and uses sunlight and the water itself to generate treatment chemicals that break down contaminants. In doing this, we avoid the use of chemicals, grid energy, and generating waste and concentrates that need disposal. This helps us to achieve a high strength of water treatment while integrating well with a natural remediation landscape in mining operations. HG Nano's technologies are contributing to a more sustainable resources sector by reducing the emissions and energy required for water treatment, while producing water that is more productive for reuse and safer for eventual return to the environment. Through the Clean Resources Innovation Network program, we're working with partners in Canada's oil sands to test Solar Pass as a solution for treating the over 500 million cubic meters of water that are currently stored in mining operations. In the context of a changing climate around the globe, it's increasingly important that we pay attention to stewardship of our limited water resources. This is especially relevant in the context of growing mining and energy sectors to power ourselves to a more sustainable future. Our goal is to develop technologies like SolarPass that can make sustainable management of water possible in these large industrial operations, as well as developing future variants that can contribute to the development of critical minerals, clean fuels, and other solutions that can use natural energy sources to power a sustainable future. SolarPass is a built-in Canada technology solving one of Canada's major water treatment challenges. 
and we've done so with support from across the country. From the first days at the University of Waterloo and the Velocity Incubator, taking an initial invention and idea from the bench scale and building a business around that opportunity. And that was done with initial call for proposals from Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, COSIA, and support from those mine operators in developing the technology from initial proof of concept to the current application of that technology in the field. And Canada has been aggressive in investing in developing these technologies in the clean tech sector through buy-in from the provincial and federal levels, Alberta Innovates, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, all putting public dollars and support behind building new clean tech that can support Canadian resource development as well as across the world. Growing into the future, everyone at H2Nano is excited at the potential of solar pass and other nature-powered technologies in ensuring a responsible development of our resources sector. Our goal is to have our technologies on every continent in mining, energy, agriculture, and other remediation applications to ensure the protection of that critical water resource that we depend on every day and to improve its reuse. But we've also realized the potential of developing technologies from the micrometer and material scale up to industrial operations to not only protect our water resources, but also to develop the critical minerals and clean fuels such as hydrogen that will help to power a more sustainable future. And we're excited to continue applying Canadian ingenuity and the industriousness of our resources sector towards a tradition of generating new clean technologies developed here at H2Nano. And we're excited to share more of those with you into the future.